just such a corner of the world. Actually, it's an island in the middle of Bay Lake, transformed into a beautiful zoological garden. Discovery Island. Throughout the years, many Five Nights at Freddy's fan games have been created with differing levels of quality. Most follow the same gameplay beats, and some even have the same premise. But very few can say they were some of the first. Some may say the first fan game was his source mod, others say it was a creepypasta game that got taken off the internet. But in the internet zeitgeist, the first fan game was made by an art on DeviantArt. Five Nights at Treasure Island was one of the first fan creations to have a unique premise and interesting mechanics. After almost a decade in the nightmare hell loop, the game came out. It's hard to find good FNAF fan games, but sometimes you find a needle in the haystack. Five Nights at Treasure Island was based off of the 2013 creepypasta Abandoned by Disney, where a journalist investigates an abandoned Disney project, Mowgli's Palace, and experiences the paranormal. After the initial boom of Freddy's, an art began production on Treasure Island and released a demo shortly after. Many YouTubers played it, most notably Markiplier, with his two videos reaching 9.2 million and 4.4 million respectively. An art was not expecting the success of Treasure Island, and after another demo, scrapped the game in order to improve it from scratch. Eventually, an art stopped working on the project, and after a ton of people taking over multiple projects, the final group to gain ownership of Treasure Island was Team Radiance, and after getting permission from Anar and the original Creepypasta creator, the final version 6.0 was released in 2020, six years after the original. Treasure Island 2020 sticks with the original gameplay but improves upon it. Every tune falls over one of three categories, shut off a camera, turn off the lights, or stand still. The problem I have with most fan games is the game focuses on one specific mechanic and only uses that one mechanic for the entire game. I'm pretty sure that's why I like Treasure Island's gameplay loop. Later nights have you constantly doing stuff, which makes it very chaotic and fun. I like how it makes the cameras important and interesting to use. The art is very reminiscent of the first demo, but it's made higher quality for a more visually interesting experience. The same goes for the tunes. Photo Negative Mickey actually looks real and not just a color picked Mickey render. The one thing I am not a fan of is Donald or Disembodied. I understand his loudness is his mechanic, but I have sensitive ears and his voice makes them ring. It's a personal issue, but hey, it's my video. The story is that you are an intern for the Supernatural Studies Association, which has you tasked with documenting Treasure Island. It takes the story of the creepypasta and changes it just slightly to make it more interesting and fit the gameplay. I like it. This is a Freddy's fan game that has an interesting story. I did not think that would be possible. I can name like three fan games with an interesting plot, Flumpty's, Popco's, and The Joy of Creation, but that's about it. Every night you get a call from other members of the SSA, but night three is different. Night three you get a phone call from Henry Miller who is trapped in the pirate caverns. Uh, uh, hello? Hello, is anyone there? If anyone is hearing this, my name is Henry. I, I don't have much time. I'm one of the SSA's interns. I'm stuck in pirate caverns. Please, whoever finds this message, help me. I, I know a lot of things about this place. I can't say it all over the phone. They could be listening. Just please come get me out of here. I'm on the second floor. Before you can finish what he's saying, the call gets cut off with Henry presumably being killed. After the night ends, you enter the caverns and the post night starts. The pirate caverns are free roam segments where you have to explore and find keys while either the face, a distorted Mickey Mouse, or undying, a Mickey mascot chases you. I love this section. It's hard to get free roam right, but they did it. My only complaint is it's not as long as I would like it to be, but even then you can make the claim that short and sweet, and I, I cannot disagree. Both game modes have a great loop to them and it's perfect, including the final boss. The final boss of Treasure Island is Hourglass, who went from the Green Goblin to Bendy in the Dark Revival. Hourglass is every tune besides the face and Undying melted together, and they make you use every method of defense to survive. The strategy against Hourglass is to look at the cameras to see what their starting position is. Wherever they start directly correlates to what mechanic you have to use. If they are in the bathroom or locker room, you have to stand still. If they are on the roof, you have to turn off the lights. And if they are not in either of these places, you have to shut a camera off. I love this boss. Other fan games cannot seem to get bosses correct. Either it's a regular night, it's impossibly hard, or it's juniors and it's really fucking good. Hourglass is the perfect middle ground. There isn't anything particularly stylish, but it's a nice challenge and it feels like a climactic end to an amazing fan game. 
Team Radiance for the last few years has made various remakes of old fan games so they can be preserved in higher quality like some mutation of the Library of Alexandria, Those Nights to Remember, Five Nights at Chuck E. Cheese, Treasure Island, and recently, the 2022 sequel. They are angrier than they were before. There's nothing I can do now. I wish whoever finds these messages the best of luck and of audio luck. Oblitus Casa is an odd one to talk about. It's a really good game, but it's extremely buggy. The final night is incredibly hard compared to the rest of the game, and the post-night tunnels are bugged, but let's get there when we get there. The art is improved even more, and it feels like a natural evolution from the dirty, grungy designs of Treasure Island to the grotesque and melty designs of Oblitus Castle. The environment feels like it goes in the exact opposite direction of Treasure Island in a good way, following a more rustic look instead of a cartoony warehouse one. This place looks like my grandma's house. The idea to make the location a cabin, attic, and all is a great move. It makes it more scary because it's not something futuristic. It's a cabin. You have a music box, a camera flash, a notebook as a guide, and a lighter. You are stuck in a room with slightly cracked doors. You're alone, and they want you. Much like Treasure Island, the tunes make you use one of three defenses. Willie and Dippy make you use the music box to lure them away from your room. Photo Negative Minnie and Daisy make you use the camera flash to send them back. Belio makes you erase a drawing that slowly appears in your notepad, which, yeah, it's a pretty cool mechanic. It's a glorified music box, yeah, but it's separate from the camera, and it's fun to frantically move your mouse across a piece of paper. And Corrupted Face that shows up in the attic. You have to shine a lighter on him to make him leave. Just make sure Pete isn't there, you're dead. The gameplay loop is just like Treasure Island, so I... I, I like it. It's pretty cool. Oblitus Casa is a fairly easy game, which makes you wonder why there is a death minigame. If you die, you get sent to post-mortem, where you get another chance at life if you find hidden Mickeys on the camera. I think the mechanic is pretty cool, but it honestly fits better in a harder game. Not something like this. After every night, you have to explore the utility tunnels or whatever the fuck this 3x3 square is. All you have to defend yourself is your lighter and your legs. Hourglass is also in the tunnels, so make sure not to run into them. This mode is not very fun, and it's very easy to cheese if you just don't turn on the lighter, because for whatever reason, if the light is never turned on, our glass is not active. After four nights of the regular game, this happens. No. No. No, 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 no! What did you do? They were children, my children. I took them under my care. I protected them. You people shouldn't have come here. I shouldn't have led you. I've seen what you people do here. Everything that you do here. I was wrong. I just say, the animation in this cutscene is fucking beautiful. Hourglass moves like a real creature and not something from a video game. The final night is versus mother slash mick mick slash actual real life god, I think. Much like Hourglass in the first game, mother acts as the notepad, music box, and camera flash. If she has eyes, flash, if not, use the music box. But unlike Treasure Island, the face is also active, albeit much harder and looking a lot worse from wear. It takes longer to get rid of him now. Instead of Pete sometimes being in the attic, mother has a unique sound cue to try and trick you when you go into the attic. And it's best to make sure you know which sound is which before you accidentally go upstairs and die. This night is definitely much harder because of mother speed, but also there is no post-mortem. You have one chance. Don't fuck it up. The whiplash from nights 1 to 4 and night 5 is very apparent. Night 5 is incredibly difficult and near impossible, but it makes beating it all the more rewarding. I enjoy Oblitus Casa. I don't love it or think it's amazing. I enjoyed it. The art has an insane amount of polish, but the gameplay is made with spaghetti code and isn't as good as it could be. Luckily, Radiance is making Oblitus Casa 2.0, which will improve every major issue and remake the tunnels. I am very excited about that. They also include a custom night and creepypasta challenges, but I don't like the challenges, so... <laughs> Bye.